Thank you for listening to SPN, the Savage Podcasting Network. You're listening to the Stephen Savage Show on the Savage Podcasting Network. And now here's your host, film and television director, Stephen Savage. How you doing, everybody? Savage here with you for another episode of the Stephen Savage Show, podcasting from beautiful Idlewild, California, just two hours east of Los Angeles, but a world away at over 5,000 feet high atop beautiful Mount San Jacinto, overlooking the amazing Coachella Valley. Uh, today's podcast, um, as our, our past few have been, is sponsored by the all-new Paramount Network, the company I'm currently under contract with, uh, home of the hit series Yellowstone, starring Kevin Costner. And if you don't have the Paramount Network, please con- contact your local cable or dish provider and demand that they get it together and hook you up. So before I introduce my special guest for today, I want to take a moment Once again, to thank all of our listeners for your growing support of the podcast and of the Savage Podcasting Network. Uh, Listenership just keeps getting bigger each week on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean.com, and of course the Savage Podcasting Network YouTube channel. And I just wanted you to know how much I appreciate you all listening in. Uh, I want to clear up just a couple of things that people have been writing in about regarding future guests that I've been promising over the past couple of months or so. And finally, some of those schedules seem to be lining up for us, so I'm happy to report that Emmy winner and multiple recipient of the NAACP Image Awards, Mr. Christoph St. John, will be here for sure on the podcast in a few weeks. And uh, my good friend Ann Archer, who um, I've been trying to put this together forever, she's a busy lady, but she'll be my guest in early November, and I haven't spoken to Ann for a few months, so I'm excited to have her on. She is uh, on the uh, grand jury of my film festival, and um, I, I want to go over a few things about the upcoming festival uh, on that show as well. So keep an ear out for those upcoming interviews. But for today's show, it's my pleasure to introduce a man who I've been a big fan of since forever. And um, uh, I I guess we've been friends now approaching seven or eight years. And he's one of uh, American television's most prolific directors, directors of the past few decades, working on such hit shows as uh, the list is amazing. NCIS, JAG, Promised Land, um, even going back to some of his early work on a uh, iconic series like Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, Magnum P.I., on and on and on. <laughs> and uh, He's uh, just now putting finishing touches on a brand new movie he's written and directed, which will be premiering at the the film festival I just mentioned, the uh, festival I'm the proud director of. Um, the movie's called Take My Hand, and the, the film festival is the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema. So, ladies and gentlemen, my guest for today is Mr. Alan J. Levy, and uh, he's calling in from his home in Los Angeles. Alan, how are you, my friend? Well, you make me sound like I'm about <laughs> 87 years old or so. Hey, well, I remember all these shows, so I'm right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> we're in, we're, if that's the case, we're in the same boat. <laughs> I was much younger when we met. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. Um, yeah. I was I was trying to remember when we were first introduced. I believe it was you and I were both on some panel at the of directors at the Screen Actors Guild Conservatory at the uh, at the American Film Institute, and I was fortunate enough to have. Uh, you attend the Idlewild Film Festival shortly after that, and that's when I, I got to meet your beautiful wife, uh, actress Sandra Curry, who my audience will know from The Hangover 1, 2, and 3, among her countless other film and TV credits. And uh, it just seemed like uh, when I met you guys, I'd stumbled upon people who's, well, uh, you, Alan, especially, your directing work, I, I've been admiring for a long time without having put a face to it, which is uh, um you know what directors always say i have director fame i think it was soderbergh who said that where he can actually do his work do big work but go go to starbucks and no one will even know who he is <laughs> I think that's good so so oh, oh yeah really <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny it's i think other than maybe Spielberg. well you're being very you're being very kind no it's absolutely true so i'm honored to uh, now call you my friend so um i think if i'm re- if i remember correctly that's how we first met 
I'm sorry, say again? I said, if I remember correctly, that was where we first met, though, was yes. at AFI. Yeah, yeah, no, it was. It was. Yeah. It was eight or nine years ago, at least, was it not? Yeah, something like that, I would say, yeah, because when you first came to my film festival, um, you uh, it had it wasn't very old. The festival's going into its tenth year next March, and uh, and so it was only a couple years old. So I would say eight or nine years for sure. Wow, yeah. time is passing very quickly. <laughs> yeah, I never thought we'd get past year one. <laughs> here we are, and we're uh, we're and working, here we are. Yeah, we're working on our uh, our Oscar, our Ampus accreditation, which looks pretty good for maybe twenty twenty. So um, yeah, long time. I like to start off my interviews by allowing my audience, especially young film filmmakers out there, to get to know my guests through uh, their personal journeys. And and Alan, I'm f- I'm familiar to a great extent with your work, of course, but even if I, you know, I, I, I don't really know the story of how you actually became a filmmaker, where you started and, and when you realized that you had sort of, as they say, made it in Hollywood, when, when you just know you're in Hollywood to stay. So if you don't mind giving us just some, just some background on, on, your, on your road and trail into, uh, into doing so much great work. Well, I, I actually knew pretty early um, when I was a, a kid, my dad was a, uh, uh, a home engineer. I mean, uh, he, he would build anything, and I had two hobbies. I was building electronics and, and uh, had a hobby of photography and sound recording and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. and I, went, I went to see a movie uh, one, one weekend when I was um, 15, and uh, I came home, and the movie just made me like the happiest kid in the world. I thought, <laughs> wow, that's, that's unbelievable. It was called Good News with June Ellison and Peter Lawford and uh, Mel Torme and, and wow. I don't know how many I don't know how many of your listeners even remember those people but anyway <laughs> it was a mu- it was a musical and I came home and I, uh, on a Sunday I sat down with my folks they were we were just sitting around after breakfast and I said to my dad uh, and mom and dad I said uh, you know I saw a movie last night it made me so happy. If that's what movies do, I want to make people happy, and I'm going to make a movie. And my dad kind of glanced up from reading the <laughs> comics books or comic um, uh, in the Sunday paper, and he mm-hmm. said, "Sure, son. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I got it. I got on my bike and I rode over to a friend's house, and I said, "I'm going to make a movie, and I'm going to set up a, a company, and uh, it was called Petite Productions." And uh, I said, well, you want to be my vice president? And he said, uh, absolutely. He's How now, old were you again? I was, I was 15. Oh, great. Okay. So um, there was a one-act play that was put on in my high school written by uh, a senior at that time. And it was about a half-hour play. And it was a, kind of a fun little story about, about a, a young married couple whose uncle dies and leaves this house to them. And unbeknownst to them, the house is haunted. Uh-huh. And I thought this is this is going to make a really cute movie. Anyway, uh, May thirty first, nineteen fifty one. Don't count. Um, <laughs> I, I I shot this half hour black and white sound movie, uh, and that was my story. It was called Keep Your Spirits High, and it was just the story of the young couple who finally made a deal with the spirits that mm-hmm. they would live in in the attic and not bother them. And once a month they would give a party and all the spirits could come down and have a party and go back up to and, and live their life in the attic. Uh, that was it. 1951. Huh. From that time on, I had, uh, I just kept making movies when I was in high school. I was a sophomore in high school. Mm. Well, what, uh, what digital camera did you use for that movie? <laughs> what what did you say what what <laughs> i was saying what what uh what what which hd camera did you guys actually use for that movie so you're, <laughs> you're um you're talking about in those days you actually had to shoot on film everything was and getting yeah, it processed right. and it, to get yeah. started in those days must have been uh must have been horrific did you have any sort of formal training any film school training at all or are you more like tarantino who i guess just you know he just loved movies and became a director not really i i had a photography as a hobby mm-hmm. and uh, b- being a, a, a young builder of of stuff 
uh, I built the lights and I built the sound boom and the, the microphone boom and a dolly on wheels and mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I went to every movie I possibly could, read every magazine I possibly could. In mm-hmm. fact, I started reading the American Cinematographer uh, in 1951. Mm-hmm. And um, and that was my uh, the first movie cost me two hundred and thirty eight dollars. Mm-hmm. Anybody who wanted to be in the movie had to donate ten dollars. Mm-hmm. And and anybody who wanted to be on my crew had to donate fifteen dollars. So mm-hmm. for two hundred and thirty-eight dollars, I had thirty-one minutes of film uh, purchased, and the film is twenty-nine and a half minutes long. So I didn't have room for take one. I didn't have if, if something had happened, I wouldn't have had a movie. I mm-hmm. had I had no overages, no coverage, and and it was it was fun and and it was it was shown throughout. Uh, St. Louis, mm-hmm. where I was raised as a, a teenage company movie, and uh, on television there, and it made the rounds of the high schools, showing, you know, what uh, some energetic but somewhat foolish uh, high school sophomores could do. <laughs> when did you pack up and head for head for L.A.? Well, by the time I, I went to Northwestern mm-hmm. uh, and uh, have a minor in engineering and a, and a, and a major in radio, TV, and film and psychology, mm-hmm. and I had made uh, 50, 53 pictures by the time I got to, no, I'm sorry, 48 pictures by the time I got to Northwestern. Wow. wow. And, uh, and so when I got out of Northwestern, I went back to St. Louis and uh, helped put a TV station on the air. Mm-hmm. And I directed about 2,200 hours of live television, and while I was saving my money to come out to here and come out here, and in 1960, I, I came to Los Angeles to uh, take my chances, and uh, that was October 1960. And you, I mean, not just came out without many connections or anything at all, which is yeah. Well, I, I did have a connection. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was a junior in high school, I kind of thought, well. Uh, I better just, you know, tackle this by with everything that I got. And I found that there were three, I did some research, and I found that there were three people in Hollywood, three stars in Hollywood, who had mentored or helped young people get started. Mm-hmm. And I wrote to all three, and the only one I heard back from was Dick Powell. Um, and uh, Dick said, well, you know, keep me apprised, and when you want to come out here, let me know, and... I sent him the films that I had made, and we corresponded for a while. And then in 1953, between high school and college, I came out under his auspices, and he and I studied with him for seven weeks. He, he for each week he would put me in a studio with a director for a week, and then with a makeup man for a week, and then an editor for a ah, week, and so on. Yeah. So it was it was pretty marvelous. And then when I got out of college and I came out here. Um, I went to see Dick. He was at that time head of four star pictures and, uh, the son of a gun, I'll tell you something. I, I, uh, I owe a lot of my life to him because I walked into his office and uh, we sat down and we chatted and he said, listen, I'll tell you what, this is not an easy community to break into, but, um, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a challenge. I want you to go out and try and find a job. And if you don't find one by the time your money runs out, you come back over here and you've got a job with me. Mm. So he set me out on that limb. (laughs) And uh, about three weeks later, I I found a job as an assistant producer at uh, MGM on a a TV show at that time called... um, uh, um, What was the name of that one? There were two of them. There was Father of the Bride and National Velvet. Mm. And they were both TV series based on the uh, on the Liz Taylor movies, mm-hmm. and then I was there for three and a half years, and then I it did a pilot over there as a producer, and then I left there, and then I started directing. Wow! So that was basically your film school was just Dick Powell kicking you out and saying, "Go do it." <laughs> well, but at the end of the summer, let me tell you this because I I, I have tried to pay back the universe ever since then at the end of the seven weeks before i went back to college Mm -hmm. i walked into dick powell's office and i sat down and and dick's kind of was leaning behind his a chair he was leaning back in a chair behind his desk and he said well alan he's when when are you going to go back to college Mm -hmm. and at that moment i think i probably said the stupidest thing i've ever said in my Mm -hmm. life and i i said "Uh, i'm not going back and he said well why not and i said 
because I want to make movies, and you don't need an education to make movies. Well, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, he, he got off of his chair, and he walked around, and he sat on the edge of the couch, and he looked down at me, and he said, Alan, you see that door? He said, you walk out that door and get back on the bus, go back to St. Louis, go to Northwestern, and if you don't graduate, you don't know me, and I don't know you, out. Wow. And he and he kicked me out, and we stayed in touch the whole time. In fact, the wonderful thing about that was uh, just a little little thing here. And I got back to St. Louis. It took me three days on the bus. And the first night I was sitting there with my folks at dinner, and I said, i got to tell you a story. And so I told them that story, and my mom just sat there with a grin on her face, and she got up, and she walked over to her desk. She handed me a letter. Mm-hmm. To my parents from Dick Powell saying, dear Mr. and Mrs. Levy, forgive me the way I talked to Alan and that I kicked him out of my office, but it's always been important to me to make sure that anybody that I help has an education because even though they think they don't need it, just wait till he graduates. Mm. It was very, very, very rewarding. How many people in in this industry, let alone any other industry, actually would take that much time of their own time, especially on the level of a Dick Powell to... Uh, to take that much interest in somebody. That's that's a pretty amazing story. It's very rare. It is, it is an amazing story, and I love to tell it because years later, I'm, I'm directing the pilot to the Hulk, and uh, my unit production manager says said to me, um, uh, what are you doing about 11 o'clock today? And I said, nothing, and we were just in prep. And he said, well, he said, I've got a... Uh, I've got a, a location manager coming down to talk to you about uh, what you what you see as, as some of the locations so he can scout for you. Mm-hmm. I said, fine. So I went down to his office about 11 o'clock, and in walks this, this young boy, probably 28, 27, 28 years old. And I looked at him, and I thought, holy gee, many... And he stuck out his hand, and he said, um, he said, Hi, Alan, I've, I've been waiting to, to meet you. My name's Richard Powell, Dick Powell's son. Ah, uh, wow. And I said to him, You don't remember, do you, Ricky? And he looked at me, and he said, Nobody calls me Ricky. What do you, what, how do you know that? And I said, What are you doing for lunch? And he said, Nothing. And I said, Okay, we're going to lunch. i got a long story to tell you. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's, uh, I think... Yeah, as a son, it's nice to hear about your dad, and yeah, that's inter- That's great. That's a great story. Um, let's talk about your directing style for a moment. Uh, you, first of all, who are your influences early on? You were mentioning uh, that you went to the movies all the time. Who are the directors who kind of just hit you in the head and just you just made you really take notice? Well, Billy Wilder was mm-hmm. probably my strongest because uh, and Billy directed... He was a film director. He was not just a a comedy director or a, 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 a drama director or a musical director. He he tackled a lot of different uh, genres of filmmaking, and he was he was uh, kind of like uh, I think Wilder was one of my heroes. Mm-hmm. But then I also you know the 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 epic guys, the the guys like John Ford and uh, Houston and. Uh, a lot of the old. I was. I always said I was born too late. <laughs> these guys, <laughs> these guys had such individualistic styles, mm-hmm. and they and they, you know, the famous the famous story about Houston was, and I've tried to every once in a while to emulate that is that he never gave direction a lot. He would often say to the, the actors would say they do a take or two, and the actors would say, well. Uh, uh, John, what do you want? And he said, "I just want you to do another one, do another take." <laughs> That's great. You know? And 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 uh, so you know, I've, I've tried to learn from from everybody and that, that I possibly could picked up a lot. My style is kind of a moving style. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I like I like a fluid camera that doesn't call attention to itself, but there's a reason to do it mm-hmm. and. Uh, and I love to communicate with actors because um, I just uh, on the film that I just made, I, uh, Barbara Bain. I'm sure you know Barbara. Mm-hmm. You know she's just a, a sensational woman, and she's been directed probably by everybody in the business now. And she's 87 years old, and she's absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. She she's sharper than I am by tenfold, <laughs> and um, I. I 
and after we did the film, she came up to me and she said, you gave me one direction. And it was so simple that that, uh, that I will always remember. And I said, what was that? And she said, you came up to me and you said, Barbara, less is more. And you turned around and walked away. Mm. And, uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, actors are challenges because each one is individualistic and mm. they have their own ways of doing things. And uh, and that's why I I wanted to one of my majors was psychology because I think I think um, you've got to sometimes uh, give the actor direction so that they think they came up with it instead of you. Right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know this. You're a director. Yeah, but it, well, that that kind of leads into my next question because you you've worked so much television. Um, with so many different producers and studios. Do you feel your directing style or the way you prefer to work, does that change at all from different TV project to project? I mean, TV's a grind as it is. I mean, this, the speed at which television works um, is is phenomenal. But where film is a totally different animal, a lot of times if you've got the budget, you can be you can slow down. But go over some of where you find the differences between those two mediums, between being a film director and being a, a, a television director. Well, in general, I think that uh, film directing is a director's medium. Mm -hmm. uh, the director's in fairly much in charge of it. I mean, uh, certainly with the producer next to him. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, in television, uh, the producer, it's a producer's medium. It's not a director's medium. Right. The producer sets the tone, sets the pace, does the casting. Uh, certainly the directors are in casting sessions, but mm -hmm. he's the one that hires all the leads, um, you know, and, and, and when he creates the series. And he creates not only the series, but he creates a, tries to create a style. Now a director uh, can certainly bring his own style into what is already the style of the show. Mm -hmm. Um, there are, uh, golly, I don't know how many different styles of shows I've directed, but it, I think it's important that all directors kind of merge a little bit of their own thoughts. That's why they're hired mm -hmm. into the style of the show. But every show has, I won't say every show, many shows have its, have their own style. Um, Rod Holcomb, when he was, uh, uh, hired to direct, uh, the pilot of ER, uh, he totally set that style. He came in with a uh, steady cam, mm -hmm. and he would do shots that lasted for five, six, seven minutes, and not cover them with moving cameras and mm. and everything. He set the style for that show, and and so it is. I think it, it on a pilot on a pilot, the, the director can do that um, underneath the, the the aegis of the of the producer. Mm. But uh, t TV is really a producer's medium, and the director just has to kind of fold in with whatever the discussion is on what the style of the show and the actors. You know? Right, so they're all they're already set. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm going to save, as we get a little further into the interview, I want to talk about the, your new film uh, a whole bunch. But right now, just just for me, I want to talk a little bit about Magnum P.I. And I, I'm a huge Tom Selleck fan. Uh, I love... Uh, you know what he's done with the with those Louis L'Amour westerns. You know, you, you know me, Alan. I love westerns, and uh, you know, Quigley Down Under is still one of my top ten favorite films. But but tell us how you became involved with um, Magnum PI, and uh, geez, how nice was it to work in Hawaii for a while? Not a bad tour of duty, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best I've ever had. You know, you can be over, you can shoot 20 hours a day. And as long as they don't uh, come down on you for spending the money, and who cares? You know, it's good. And if it rains for an hour in midday, okay, that's fine. Either continue shooting or don't, whatever you want. Go go have some pokey. You know? <laughs> I got to tell you something. I just recently saw a photo of you on Google. I was just looking, you know, I just wanted to see some more background things I didn't quite know about Alan Levy. And uh, I see a picture of you, and it's a rainstorm coming down, and you and Tom Selleck and one of the other actors, and you guys are sitting under some little lean-to, uh, whatever <laughs> drink it is in your hand. I'm going, God damn, Alan, now that's a gig. 
<laughs> yeah, but, yeah but wasn't bad let me tell you wasn't bad you um, um you took that film you you had another show that you worked on was columbo but you took you were with those shows quite a bit i mean they, they took up a lot of your career if i'm not mistaken well yeah um I, what I, what i enjoyed in my career i was lucky enough to become part of a family mm-hmm. um i liked i like to do multiple shows uh, because you get to know the actors, you get to know uh, uh, what the director, what the producer is looking for. You get to know the crew, mm-hmm. and it becomes it becomes a family. And and uh, I directed I don't know if I think fourteen magnums, and then I produced um, uh, I directed three three Colombo movies, two hour movies, right. and I produced that for three years. But um, you know, working in Hawaii was just an absolute pleasure and. Mm-hmm. Probably, I would say, and people ask me this a lot. You know, what was your favorite show, or what was your favorite gig, or whatever? And mm-hmm. and I gotta put, I gotta put the Frank Sinatra show, uh, Magnum, uh, at the, at the very very oh, top of my list right. because Sinatra and I got along like brothers, and nobody expected that. We had such a wonderful time together. Mm-hmm. We really did, and it, it wasn't just hero worship. Uh, we ha- we had a good time together, um, and it, what was what was very rewarding to me, and I don't mean this as a brag, I just mean it as a moment in history, in my history that I remember, and that was at the end of the show, when I had one I had one big dolly shot around the bed and ended up on Frank's face, and he had to he had to get out of Hawaii because he had a colostomy at that time and he was giving uh-huh. it getting his colostomy reversed and he was on his own jet at 315 that that afternoon regardless of whether i was done or not mm. anyway at about three five after three i wrapped him and i walked around and just wanted to give him a hug and a thank you because that's the way it was mm. and he gave me a hug and a kiss on the cheek and he whispered in my ear he said he said he called me kid the whole time <laughs> kid <laughs> which I loved. Mm-hmm. I was no kid. <laughs> and he, he gave me a kiss on the cheek and he whispered in my ear and he said, you know, kid, you're only the second director I've ever liked to direct me. And I, I'd be darned if I was going to ask him who the other one was. <laughs> but, but, but that was, that was a moment I, I will remember until they put me under somewhere. Uh, I don't, it just, really, just, that's just that experience alone, Alan. I mean, that's a, I can't even imagine how great that memory is of uh, actually saying you directed uh, Frank Sinatra. That's that's phenomenal. It and, was his last. It was his last job. Yeah. He never he never did anything after that. He's, and such an underrated actor, you know. Even though the Academy oh. the Academy Award for uh, in um, Eternity it, uh, from Here to Eternity, but yeah. so he did in the I've I, I studied a little bit in film school. I studied his work a little bit. Um, uh, just I got into that '60s. It was the cops, the the sort of cop genre that wasn't really film noir, but it sort of was. But it also had that hip '60s vibe to it, you know. But he did a movie that I just love called Lady in Cement, and his performance was phenomenal. He's people who haven't seen that money movie need to look at look for it. It's uh, phenomenal. But yeah, just I think he was very underrated as an actor. Oh, you remember a man with a golden gun? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's... I mean, he was, he was, he was a, a, a very natural actor, mm-hmm. and uh, um, you know, everybody kept telling me you can't get take two out of him. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, and I won't tell secrets because he's gone now. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, we we had plenty of we had plenty of take twos, and we had a good time <laughs> together. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Those are I love hearing those stories. All right, so I I really now want to get into the new film, um, which I and my film festival, the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema, we're we're very proud to be the place where you will be uh, premiering the movie. So tell us about the film, the script, the cast. I know your wife Sandra, whom we mentioned before, beautiful woman, and she's one of the stars, and and her body of work is so great. So just run us through the film, what we what we can be looking forward to, and and what the process was for you. Well, this is a short. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's there's a, a gal who was in the actor studio with Sam, mm-hmm. uh, Sandra. I, mean, I call her Sam. Forget right. that. <laughs> you know, in, in fact, when I when I'm new when I'm new on a show and I say I have to go home to Sam, I stop and I, I better make an explanation. <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> and and um, I'm sorry, Alan, just a, I didn't, I, I'm so remiss in that, but it, the film is called Take My Hand, correct? Yes, it yeah. Take My Hand. Got it. Right. Okay. It, it's a 17-minute uh, festival short, mm-hmm. actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was written by an actress by the name of Eileen Gruba, and it stars Eileen and, and Sandra, my wife, and Barbara Bain. Mm-hmm. And basically, it is, uh, it's a story about what friendship means. It's a story of a young girl who loses her five-year-old daughter to cancer. And uh, she becomes a total recluse. She doesn't get out of bed for weeks, and she's um, uh, she's in really bad shape. And so her two best friends finally get in to see her, much to her objection. Mm-hmm. And it's it's what happens to that relationship within the within the film. That's, that's, it's a very simple film, but it's it's very meaningful and it's it's it's, it's very pretty. The, mm-hmm. I got to tell you. Um, I read the script and and I liked it. I thought this is going to be good. It's going to be fun working with the girls. But the three performances that these gals gave uh, took the film to a level that I absolutely did not expect. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really did a terrific job. Mm -hmm. Do you like that? As most directors do, do you like being surprised by actors who just give more than you even in your wildest imagination? Isn't that fun? Oh, yeah. I mean, and this was ultra fun for me because I've been a photographer all my life and, mm-hmm. and a DP and everything. And so I shot this and looking through the camera as I was shooting it, I was literally amazed at what was happening in front of the camera. And it was just an absolute pleasure. I mean, we uh, we shot for 13 hours a day. And at the end of the 13 hours, I didn't want to go home. I was having mm-hmm. such a good time with these guys. They were <laughs> just terrific. No, I mean, it really That's great. That's it was awesome. gorgeous. They did a great job. And um, Eileen Gruba, I actually know her, and, and I bet you I haven't spent more than 20 minutes in a room with her ever once. I mean, I, she's come to the festival, and we kind of uh, crossed paths and had a discussion, but she's worked with so many people that, that I know who just praise her talent so much. And uh, I didn't realize she had written this movie, though. That's interesting. Yeah, she she is... Uh, um, uh... She, she's disabled, as mm-hmm. you well know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, she's had cancer, recurring cancer three times, and now she's been clean for, I think, nine years, mm-hmm. which is incredible. And when she was young, she had a problem, and, and she's got a limp, and she's had her, her left leg and foot operated on the numerous, numerous times. Mm-hmm. I get it. So she's disabled, but she is very active in the Hire the Disabled, mm-hmm. Hire the Women and Hire the Disabled organization, and... Um, this is kind of an offspring, um, in, in such a way that the, the young girl who loses her, her daughter to cancer, she becomes disabled mentally, mm-hmm. not physically. Mm-hmm. And that's why Eileen wrote it because she's, uh, she's a big advocate for, uh, um, bringing to light that the disabled, uh, can be helped and the disabled uh, can be hired. Right. She's done. She's. It's just one of those things, you know, or the the six degrees of separation. I've worked with so many people that she's worked with. She just did uh, last year, I think, or the year before. There was a a, a TV movie called um, Game of Silence, and uh, it was CBS, I believe. And she was on that with my friend. I believe you know him too, Connor O'Farrell. You might have met him at my. Uh, film festival yeah. connor was yeah. uh, connor was yeah, one of the yeah. stars of that and and um i lean um she did she did a, a reoccurring on that and every, i watched the show and every time i see her she just mesmerizes me but uh but sandra definitely no slouch herself i mean she's done such great work and the can your wife i have to tell you the camera just loves her she's something about <laughs> when she even in the uh the hangover movies when she walks on she's just she's a she's a force of nature you know i just really enjoy w- walk, watching her well thank you and me too <laughs> <laughs> but you get to watch her all the time i don't get to watch her that much yeah well she, she was she was in a magnum for me many many years ago oh, which is one yeah, of my yeah. favorite performances of her you know she played the princess of Turvia, which was uh, typecasting, to, to say the least, <laughs> and uh, and and that that was the movie that brought us together. That was 1983, and when we came back 
from from making uh, that magnum, she moved in with me, and that was it. You're a sly dog. <laughs> you did something right because she's so uh... Magnum's been more than very good to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, where where do you want to take the new film? And you think making movies at this point is um, since you had such a, a great time? You think it's something you'd really like to to dive into more at this moment in the foreseeable future? Well, you know, um, I've I've directed uh, sixteen films. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've directed Sandra fifteen times. Mm. And we're still married. I think that's my greatest <laughs> achievement. That's your legacy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my legacy is right. Absolutely. That's a class on directing all itself, how to be married to an amazing actress and stay married. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, ha- we have a great time. We mm. have a great time. Well, um, writing. What about the writing thing? Um, what's your relationship as a, you know with the uh, with, with screen screenwriting yourself um how much pleasure if any do you get from the process i'm i'm not a screenwriter mm-hmm. okay i i'm a, I, I i am a script doctor mm-hmm. but i don't have the talent to sit down and write a, and, and write a screenplay mm-hmm. that's not my forte and and i don't want to try it um um, I've got two pilots that I'm working on right now, which is more of a, uh, it will need rewriting from page one mm-hmm. <laughs> by somebody who knows what they're doing. Mm-hmm. But that's not, that. I, I enjoy reading a script and then you know, once we get into production of doing some doctoring on it and sitting down with the writers and telling them, uh, having a discussion with them on uh, what might enhance this scene or that scene or something mm-hmm. else. But uh I'm not a screenwriter, and, and uh, so why try something that I'm not good at? No, I think that's interesting, though, because I know so many uh, directors who, you know, writing, they're, they're constantly trying to get their, um, their projects off the ground, but they end up, because they're good directors, they end up working on other projects. But it sounds to me like writing's just not something that's ever held any, any big uh, allure for you. Not really. Um and as far as directing, you know, I'm I'm at a stage now where uh, I'll direct when and and if I want to, and uh, you know, I did it for a long time, and I'm enjoying hobbies, and I'm enjoying my free time and everything. I wake up in the morning with a list of 15 things to do, and by the time I work all day at them, I, when I go to bed at night, I've got 18 things for the next day. So mm-hmm. there's not enough time in the day, and and. Uh, I don't. I don't actually know how the heck I survived when I was directing uh, five days a week, fifty weeks out of the year. I have no idea. Hmm. I don't have time to keep up with it now. <laughs> so, you know, one more I, one more thing yeah. I wanted to, to to touch upon is that we we talked about it uh, just about a week ago, a little bit. But um, I'm at I'm at Paramount now, and I just love just the just the process of just going through the gates at a and getting your parking at a at a major studio Me like too. that. And you said Absolutely. that, and I said after all these years, because Paramount was like a, a stomping grounds for you for a long time, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, I was uh, I was lucky, uh, very lucky. I mean, I've been lucky my whole life. I've been at, at the right place at the right time a lot of times. And mm-hmm. there are there are many many directors out there who are much more talented than I am. But I'm more stubborn than they are, so, <laughs> and that's meant something. I mean, there are some really great directors in television, mm-hmm. especially today. The young guys are just un- unbelievable. But I have literally worked at every studio in this town mm-hmm. at one time or another. Mm-hmm. And walking through those gates or, or through the arches or whatever mm-hmm. it may be is still a thrill for me, as it was when I was at MGM. When I came out from L.A. and I was at MGM for National Velvet and Father of the Bride and a couple of other shows, um, they were shooting Mutiny on the Bounty and the Brothers Grimm, and there were... There were I walked down the center street there one day when all the Tahitian girls were coming up and all the <laughs> the little people from Brothers Grimm and Jumbo and all the circus people oh, and the elephants and everything. And I just stood there and I thought I had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> yeah, it's just the experience. I'll never, I'm like you, I'll never get tired of it. I'll never. And, and uh, 
it's just something the buzz that hits you the people who are you know crew people and even the catering and and just just the the cleanup crew and and you just there's just a buzz in a studio that you you never get used to or get oh, jaded you know absolutely absolutely and it's it, and today it's still exactly the same for yeah, me believe yeah, it or not that's great yeah yeah really um so we're about out of time for this episode, Alan. It just flew by. I, I, I don't even know how to thank you enough, um, my guest, Alan Levy, for calling in today. Alan, it's been a real treat having you on, my friend. Thanks so well, much. thank you for your time and, and a pleasure. And I always have a good time talking with you. We, we don't. We don't have enough time to talk about everything. <laughs> That's right. Because well, but I can thanks, li- I can listen to you all day long, but you <laughs> you have a way of making me feel like you're you're interested in my stories as well. And I go, why in the hell is Alan Levy caring about what I have to say? <laughs> I love I love to hear him. <laughs> uh, and just a, a reminder: you can find this show on iTunes and Spotify and Podbean uh, Podbean dot com, and of course on the Savage Podcasting Network YouTube channel. So for Alan J. Levy and myself. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Alan. Thanks again, Savage. Really. Some days it's bound